My name is Matthew Short. I am a uh, ELCA pastor from just north of here in Slinger. Um, and it's my honor to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Mike Ward. Uh, Mike is passionate about stewardship and how it can lead renewal in the church, not just follow it. Um, he is a Lutheran pastor as well as a certified fundraising executive. Um, and he's now a partner in the consulting firm GSB. Um, with them, he works with congregations and church institu institutions all across the country and across denominations. I see in your bio, it says you work with eight different judicatories, which almost qualifies you as a district president or bishop. Um, <laughs> and uh, he currently serves on the ELCA Church Council and was previously on the board of the Youth Ministry Network. Um, his clients include everything from small business startups that are just launching annual fund programs to larger institutions that are doing uh, multi-phase major appeals. So he brings a broad perspective that's going to be a blessing to us. Um, prior to joining GSB, Mr. Ward was VP of Advancement at Novus Ways Ministries, and prior to that served as youth and family pastor at St. Mark's Lutheran in Charlotte. Uh, he lives near Asheville, North Carolina with his wife and two children, and in his free time he is a beekeeper, which probably has more parallels to stewardship than we'd like to admit, but hopefully with us you'll need less protective gear. Let's m welcome Mr. Mike Ward. Come right. I actually have a talk about how churches should be more like beehives. Uh, you're not getting that today, but... If you don't believe I'm a beekeeper, there you go. <laughs> Let's start with two stories. The first is about Anna, not her real name, who approached me with a tear in her eye streaming down her cheek following a workshop that I had just led on stewardship. She shared how she would often skip church during the weeks of the stewardship appeal. Can you imagine? She shared how she wasn't willing to serve on congregation council because she knew she wasn't tithing or giving anywhere close to that, and her integrity would not allow for her to lead when she knew she was not leading in her giving. She shared that by talking so much about tithing that the stewardship appeal at her church actually caused her shame. She shared that the tear on her cheek, though, today was one of joy because she heard the gospel during our time together. And she would commit to growing in her generosity. Last year, Anna gave $45 to her congregation. This year, she committed to giving a dollar a day, or $365. That's a growth rate of 800%. A gift that would never have come had tithing been the only story told. A second story, Tim and Mary, not their real names, are members of a Lutheran congregation in a campaign that I was not part of to build a new facility, they made a $25,000 gift. A generous gift, we might think. After training the pastor to do donor visits, I went on a visit to Tim and Mary during a debt reduction campaign. You know the fun one. Three years later, we asked Tim and Mary if they wouldn't give the largest gift that we needed, a gift of $150,000. And you know what they said to us immediately? Thank you. Thank you for asking us what you need us to do. Thank you for having the courage to share with us the vision for ministry. You know, in that last campaign, nobody asked us or gave us any guidance in what we should give, and so we just came up with something on our own. Turned out it was pretty easy. Yes, we'll donate the $150,000. So Forbes magazine, you know, the go-to guide for where to get your biblical information, <laughs> shares shares that money is mentioned in the Bible over 800 times. Of 39 parables that Jesus told, 11 of them had to do with money. It stated that Jesus talked about money more than any other topic uh, that he brought up. Yet I've heard pastors apologize for talking about money. I've heard lay people say that pastors have no business knowing what people give to the church. I've heard people saying giving is a private matter between me and God. Well, I'm going to expose all of these lies in the course of my uh, talk today, but um, just I've heard that. I believe that the state of generosity in America, in our churches, is the biggest hindrance to building vital faith communities. Some people like to blame those who aren't giving much or at all. I would like for us to stop the blaming. Stop blaming anyone. 
unless you really just want to blame ourselves for not updating our stewardship practice and not boldly talking about money, you know, the way that Jesus did. In the book Passing the Plate, which is a sociological study of giving, the following are some reasons that are lifted up, and I'm going to be honest with you, I've, I've added a couple of my own for my own practice. I'm not going to differentiate between which they are, though. You're going to have to go read the book if you want to know. But we have a church culture that is not taught very well about giving. We still talk about tithing, and we talk about it in a legalistic way. We need to remember tithing as an Old Testament concept. Generosity would be a New Testament concept. And we also fail to recognize that the value of the tithe was actually to prove to ourselves we didn't need it. The tithe wasn't used to balance the church budget. The tithe was used to burn something up, to destroy it, to show God that we didn't need all that God had provided to us. So what else do we have in our, in our cultures? We have finance committees filling the void that has been left by stewardship and council leadership, on, and, make, and we've turned stewardship into a financial issue rather than a spiritual one. Many of you, and I'm not going to ask for a show of shame, or I mean a show of hands, We'll publish weekly the box score in your bulletins about how much money came in last week versus how much was needed, and so therefore we are behind by this much now. This is not helpful. Stop doing it today. And I would even like to tell you that many times you are lying to your congregation because, believe it or not, December is always your best month and you fail to mention that and assume 152nd coming in weekly. So just stop that process because it has nothing to do with stewardship and it's just poor communication. The other thing it shows is that the budgeted need is the, the most possible mission that could ever possibly take place within your congregational ministry. And so we set the budget really as the ceiling to give to rather than where it should be the floor because there should be vision and mission beyond that. Anyway, I have a few personal biases about that. <laughs> Earlier this year, I, I won't throw the Senate or the bishop under the bus, but it, I was at a Senate assembly and following a presentation, I, I approached the bishop, who's a client of mine, and I said, never again should you allow the treasurer to speak in public. I said, would you like a memo to that effect, or can you just carry that message yourself? And he said, I'd like a memo, please. Um, all the treasure did was set the stage for scarcity thinking and reinforce the many excuses for not giving. I believe it is the Finance Committee's job. It is an important job, but it is the Finance Committee's job to keep track of where we are. It is the stewardship team and the council and the pastor leadership to cast a vision, to inspire people to want to give and then ask people to grow in their generosity for the sake of the kingdom of God. More on that later. We've created a, a culture of pocket change donors and we've done it with good intentions and it's just something else that we should stop. For decades now, we have seen parents in their, uh, in their pew at the time of the offering hand a quarter or some other piece of pocket change to their children and say, dump this in which is cute, right? However, because we are afraid to talk about giving in our homes and in anywhere in our society, what we have taught our kids is that giving is pocket change. Again, it's a process that we should stop. For four years as a parish pastor, and now even as I do this work, I teach confirmation because I love middle school kids. Every year on Stewardship Sunday, I have a question for my confirmation group. How much your, did your parents decide to give this year? I served in Charlotte, North Carolina. All of the parents were bankers, and they didn't find my question to be very appropriate. <laughs> there's a reason I'm not a bishop or a president, and there's maybe a reason I'm not a parish pastor as well. I then went on to say, well, how did they make their giving decision? And again, it's just blank looks. They didn't know, and they kind of wondered what I was, was after. But how are we teaching our children? And let's not blame our parents, please, because their parents didn't talk to them, whose parents didn't talk to them, whose parents didn't talk to them. So every generation in the room is responsible, I guess. I'm tired of the blaming. Parents don't talk to their children for a reason, I think, and Jim Ledoux can probably tell me if I'm wrong. I think parents don't talk to their children about giving because they've heard that tithing is the standard, and they don't and they don't want their children to think that they're not perfect. You know, newsflash, parents, your kids already know that. 
at least mine do. But we don't need to carry on a culture that doesn't talk about money. The best lesson a child could learn is from a parent who says it is a struggle. We have things we'd like to do on our own, but we need to give back to God who first gave to us. The next thing we have going on is we have congregations that don't have bold visions. We've heard a little bit about that already. 97% of gifts given to the local congregation stay local. And by local, I mean within the walls of the church. They're for salaries and facilities. We know what they're for. This stifles giving. We have convinced ourselves, have you ever heard that our people are giving all that they can? Well, no, they're not. We only see scarcity when we do what John Maxwell says not to do. John says to dream God-sized dreams. We have allowed scarcity to impact our ability to vision, and it's not helping our stewardship, and it's a never-ending cycle downward. I've heard congregations say things like, hey, good news, we've held the budget flat this year. Do you know what I hear when I hear that statement? Hey, God doesn't have a darn thing planned for us next year, so don't bother giving anything extra because we wouldn't figure out what to do with it anyway. <laughs> we need to have a vision of what to do. I know somebody, I've, I've had the privilege of being mentored by someone who gives about $10,000 a year uh, to his congregation. Sounds great, right? He and his wife recently gave a million dollar gift to another uh, religious affiliated institution. So I said, why did you choose to give a million dollars to them and, and not to your congregation? And he looked at me and he said, my congregation can't handle it. I often tell folks, we don't get million dollar gifts in the church because we don't have million dollar visions. And the same is true, we don't get $5,000 gifts because we don't have $5,000 and $10,000 visions. One of the biggest things I, I'm seeing, and I'm seeing it across the country, and I think it is bred into our Lutheran DNA, our DNA, is we fail to inspire around the area of giving. We are all about the facts. We like to tell people what we are doing and who is doing it and when we are going to do it. But for some reason, we forget to tell people why we are doing it. I recently, I travel a ton, and I'm not in my local congregation a lot on Sunday mornings, uh, but I, I was there one Sunday, and, and the announcements went on for a while. I, I remember that it was for a while. And when I got home, I had to run home. My, my uh, wife and my son had to go to confirmation practice for the following week. And as I was making my sandwich before I had to go to uh, South Carolina for some meetings, I said to myself, you know, there were announcements today. What were they? This is within an hour and a half of the announcements taking place. I'm asking my, myself the question, what announcements were made today? And you know what? I couldn't think of a single one. Because all we did is stand up and spew information at people. There was no inspiration there. Um, I, I laugh anymore when I do strategic planning with a congregation and somebody might dare to say, we need to work on communication here. Well, of course we do, but we might want to focus on the message of why are we doing what we're doing? What is God about here? And that's what people might want to hear and pay attention to. It's not that we don't talk at them. It's we don't inspire with them. Best inspiration I've ever seen was in a church in Florida on Mother's Day. 5,000 in worship, stadium seating. At the time of the offering, pastor walks out with a couple of plates under his, uh, under his arm. And I say, there's got to be more somewhere. We're going to be here for a while. But he's, he comes out and he says, hey, folks, before we collect your gifts this week, I want to tell you a quick story about how we used your gifts last week. We had a single mom stop by the church whose car wasn't working for her. She couldn't get to work. She couldn't do her grocery shopping. She couldn't take care of her kids. It was a burden for her. So you know what we did with your gifts last week? We used those gifts, and we used them to help fix her car. And some folks in our congregation uh, went to the auto parts store, bought the parts, fixed the car. We were good stewards of your gift, but we fixed her car. And here's the thank you letter she wrote to us. Holy cow, I gave a gift. This wasn't a Lutheran congregation. I don't usually give to non-Lutheran causes. I gave a gift because they told me that they were going to actually do something for the kingdom of God with the gift that I gave. In the church today, we don't personalize anything when it comes to stewardship. I hear of a fear that we might treat somebody better than somebody else. I share that you have a whole lot more to lose if you treat generous people poorly because you treat them like the non-generous people as well. I also share with people that generous folks don't want to be treated any better. They do want to be treated differently. 
I, tra I shared that I travel a lot. My, my giving is on automatic draft, and my credit union is darn good. They haven't missed a payment yet. <laughs> my wife and our family, we give about 13% of our income away. And I have to tell you, on a personal level, I don't like getting a letter in the mail from my congregation alerting us to how far behind we are on our giving. Because we are, are not. I would much rather have a pastor call or stop by or somebody call and stop by. I don't care if it's a pastor or not. And say, hey, Mike, you know what? Uh, we see by your giving history, you really like the food pantry and sending kids to camp. We could use your help with an extra gift for that. I would be far more interested in that because I have to be honest with you, I don't really care a lick about a congregation that's behind on their budget. Doesn't inspire me at all. So we need to get better back to treating people like people. We aren't the same. And when we don't personalize our messages, we end up talking to no one. And please, stop being held hostage by the people who aren't generous and start treating the people differently on their giving patterns. But nobody any better than anybody else, please. So what do we need in the church to lead people to generous lives? I have a few things to talk about. And it comes back to one we just heard about, vision. We need to cast a vision for a congregation that will touch and change lives with the gospel. Our vision needs to discern what the critical needs of our people and our community are and discern how it is that we as a congregation are called to make an impact on the world. This takes knowing who you are, your core values, your purpose for existence, and knowing what your members and the people in your community need you to be for them based on your purpose and your existence. Your purpose is not survival for survival's sake. We are a church that believes in death and resurrection. And if you don't have a purpose and you can't discern one, perhaps it is better to die and allow something new to resurrect in its place. I've threatened, um, and our vision is not just busy work for people. I've actually threatened to fire people who worked for me before if they ever told me they were busy. I don't care about busyness, I care about impact. What are we doing to make a difference? People will give to a vision when it lines up with who they are and how they want to see God impacting the world. As a personal observation, I do see a lot of congregations adopting visions that feel a lot like all they are about is social service. Don't get me wrong, we are called to reach out and serve our neighbor. However, we are not in the words of Bishop Eaton, social service organizations with sacraments. We are the church. We share Jesus. We preach Christ crucified and risen. Social service can be one thing that we can do, but I think we are chasing it because it's tangible and then fail to tell people that we are as the church and we have something to offer them as that. I suggest you go home and interview the last 10 families that joined your place of worship and ask them what they were looking for and what they found in your place and do more of that. Once we have a vision that advances the kingdom of God, then I have a little formula for you. It's as cookie cutter as I get. We need to inform. You're Lutheran, you do that okay. We need to motivate. We need to ask, and we need to thank. You're Lutheran, we inform. <laughs> if you don't remember anything else that I share with you today, please remember this. We need a vision. And then the key to funding that vision is to inform, to motivate, to ask, and to thank. By the way, asking is not sending a letter and doing nothing else. In direct mail fundraising with a good list, a 10% response rate is considered good, so quit whining and complaining when all you do is send a letter and you get 10% back. It's good. If you get 20%, you should actually celebrate and say, hey, we did better than most. You know? So let's remember quickly what grounds our stewardship effort. We aren't just fundraisers for the sake of money. And if you do this just for money, for money's sake, and don't have an impact on the kingdom of God, people will be very unfulfilled in their giving. They will not give much. And then the only time I allow you to use the term donor fatigue is when you don't have a vision and you are simply asking for money for the sake of money because donor fatigue does not exist in an organization with a vital mission where the kingdom is being expanded. In Matthew 6.21, Jesus shares that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. With the median Protestant, that's the one in the middle, if you line us all up by uh, the percentage of income we give away, which, by the way, was an exercise we were going to do, but then I was told I only had 30 minutes, so we're not going to do that today. Um, the one in the middle gives away 0.62% of their income. I did not say 6.2%. I said 0.62% of income is what the median Protestant gives away. That means that 50% of our members are giving well less than 1% of their income. Therefore, 
if Jesus is correct, and I love to start a sentence with that. <laughs> if Jesus is correct, we don't have the hearts of our members. That's why I do this work. That's what I want is people's hearts to be engaged in our ministries. And we do that by investing our treasures in our congregations. The first article of the Apostles' Creed states, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And a friend of mine, Martin Luther, had something to say about this in the small catechism. What he says this means, I believe that God has created me and all that exists. God has given me and still preserves my body and soul with all their powers. God provides me with food and clothing. God provides me with home and family. God provides me with daily work and all I need from day to day. And all this God does out of fatherly and divine goodness and mercy, though I do not deserve it. Therefore, I surely ought to thank and praise, serve, and obey him. And this is most certainly true. But we live in a world that says, I made it. I earned it. It's mine. This might be American theology, but it is not Lutheran theology. And we need to reclaim that. It's mine might work in politics, and in fact, in southeast Minnesota, there is a politician that has that on its signs. I wanted to argue with him from the point of Luther, but I didn't stop. <laughs> By the way, it, it might be fun if Luther's right. Another fun way to start a sentence. If Luther's right, and everything we have is a gift of God, our ability to make our living, our ability to earn money, everything, our family, our lives, are truly gifts from God. It might be fun one year. Rather than ask people what they're going to give this year, ask them how much they're going to keep. I might have mentioned there's a reason I'm not a parish pastor. Um, <laughs> but do it in a way that isn't legalistic, but in a way to help them understand what Luther said about the first article of the Creed. One of my, my favorite understandings of stewardship was put forth by Mark Powell in his book, Giving to God. Uh, Mark's, uh, he was my advisor at seminary, actually, uh, at Trinity Seminary in Ohio. <laughs> I thought I had a couple of friends in the room. He notes the place of the offering in the worship service, and he notes it as the high point of the liturgy, where we can most fully, as the work of the people, put ourselves into the worship, because we can give away something of value to ourselves. I personally believe stewardship to also be a pastoral issue, and it's a key to building vital faith communities. I would be curious to know for how many congregations here that the pastor either does not know what people give, or the pastor is not allowed to know what people give. Dr. Martin Luther King Sr. is quoted as saying that the only thing that anonymous giving has led to in the church is anonymous non-giving. I'm going to give you that one again. The only thing anonymous giving has led to in the church is anonymous non-giving. I hear people say that giving is private. And I'm sorry, but that isn't true. And by the way, it's not in your constitution that the pastor is not allowed to uh, know what people give. Um, but giving is not private. Giving should be confidential, but there is no place in faith development for privacy or secrecy. And there's no place in our churches for privacy or secrecy. Are you allowed to tell your doctor, or allowed to not tell your doctor your lifestyle choices? Tell them. Those are private, I'm not going to tell you. You can't tell your accountant that your financial records are private and he's just gonna to have to do your taxes without them. <laughs> you can't tell your attorney that the, uh, that the information around those allegations is not none of his or her business. It should all be confidential, but if a pastor wants people to grow in their faith, and if your treasure, if your heart is where your treasure is, then giving cannot be private. All means, keep that confidential. Feel free to wind this tape back and play that at your next council meeting. My job as a consultant is to challenge, but not to offend. I think it's a good role and mantra for your stewardship teams and your councils and your pastoral leadership teams. So I'd be remiss at this point if I didn't talk a little bit about leadership in this area. You cannot lead people to glad and generous hearts if you yourself are not on a journey to generosity, and it is a journey. My wife and I have been able to make it to 13% of our income. We volunteer at a food pantry at least once a month. 
We're involved in animal rescue, and I have to tell you that when I left my house, there were two cats living in my office, and I have no idea how many will be there when I get back. <laughs> but we seek to be more and more generous every year. I serve on a board. We've been challenged, and, and the reason we've become givers is because of the mentoring and the challenge from people in our lives. One is Virginia, who is now 98 years old. When Bob was still living, she and Bob gave away 38% of their income. They realized that they weren't tithing and, and didn't want to set tithing as, as their mark. They agreed at that time in their life to grow by a percentage a year. And they, they were able to go until 38%, which is unfortunately the year that Bob died, and now Virginia can't quite give that much anymore, just living on, on her uh, income alone. The other is a president of a seminary who he and his wife uh, live on 50% of their income and give the other 50% away to impact the kingdom of God. They challenge me, and they are people I aspire to emulate and find the ways in which I can continue to grow in a generosity journey. We're all on that journey. We're all at different points, and that's why we treat people like people. Those who lead in stewardship must also be transparent, and the struggle is really better than the perfection if you can even identify perfection. If you serve on a council or the stewardship team, you must be on that journey. You must have people challenging you. As I wrap this up, I'd like to give you a few final thoughts. A vital nonprofit will double their giving uh, every seven years. Once again, a vital nonprofit will double giving to the organization every seven years. That should be the goal for your congregation as well. We have examples of clients who have experienced that when over and over they cast a vision, they inform, they motivate, they ask, they thank. So double, double your giving every seven years. Um, in motivation, this is what we struggle with the most. As I'm coaching many uh, organizations, including some here in Milwaukee, through a pro program called Stewardship for All Seasons, The biggest struggle I see is the ability to motivate, the ability to capture those stories of why we are doing the ministry we are about. Not just the who, the what, the where, and the when, but why, and what impact is it making? Often in our churches, we will say something like, your generosity helped send 10 kids to camp this summer, which I believe to be a fine activity to happen. But we should rather, instead of saying the number, that is simply information. Let's tell the story about the, the impact the week of camp had on Timmy because of the mentoring and the relationship he was able to build with his counselor and the faith that he has come back with to the congregation and how he's living that out in this place. And even better, have Timmy tell the story. Through men, um, this is how we will renew people's faith. When we ask, we need to treat people differently. I believe that when you ask for a gift, you should ask people for a specific dollar amount. I know that's scary for a few in the room. The amount should be based on previous giving and your new ministry goals and how you're impacting the world and what they love and cherish and are motivated by. And you should ask for enough money that you reach your goals. If you ask me to consider a gift, and consider is an important word. A gift of a specific amount, I will consider it. If motivated and capable, I will very likely make the gift. But stop saying things like, any gift is great. Please stop saying, and if every family would just give $96, we would meet our goal. Because that's not fair. $96 for one family is easy while it's an incredible burden for others. Let's treat people like people. Then please, by all means, say thank you. Gratitude is appreciated, and it's expected today. And I grew up near where Jim and Tammy Faye Baker hung out for a while. And gratitude is not just being grateful, but it's also letting people know that we used your gift for how we said we were going to use your gift. You, you apparently knew Jim and Tammy Faye. <laughs> and part of saying thank you is letting people know the impact that their gift had 
And by all means, at least tell people that you tried to do what you said you would do. I am convinced that there are a lot of people in our churches that would just like to see us try. And then let them know you learned something and you're going to make a difference in how you do it next time. I was blessed when I was VP of Advancement at the camps. I had a donor who would give me $25,000 a year to try stuff. And the only string was that I report back to uh, his family every year what we learned and what impact it had. I had deeper relationships with people than I did when I served as a parish pastor. The reason for that is we talked about money. We talked about their passions. We talked about their goals and their hopes and their dreams. We talked about how God had been active in their life. And we talked about how they wanted to see God active in the world. I'm convinced that people show up to church every week trying to discern what God is doing in the world. And they're really excited when they get to hear about it. Vital faith communities are those that talk about vision. They talk about impact. They talk about what God is doing. They talk about hopes and dreams. And you know what? They even talk about money. And it's a true joy to talk with people about money and to encourage them and invite them to participate in your mission and vision. One final quote, and I, wasn't, I thought I didn't have room for it. This is the 30 seconds. If you want to change the culture in your congregation around the topic of giving, many of you have, have, are familiar with the name Henri Nouwen. You may pronounce it Henry. Uh, Henri Nouwen, he wrote a great little book uh, called uh, Spirituality of Fundraising. You wouldn't expect Henri Nouwen to talk about fundraising. But in that book, one of the things he said is fundraising is inviting people into a deeper relationship with your vision and mission. And they are excited to do it. So if you want to change your opinion, you know, let Henri help you with that. And let him change, help change that culture around your congregation, around money, that it is an opportunity for people to better participate in your vision and mission for the world. Stewardship is awesome ministry. And it can lead to a vital faith community in your place. Thanks so much for your time. Oh, <laughs> if you inform and motivate and ask, I might send you a copy of what I just talked about. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs>